So we, we like to think there's a bit online, which the pure plays, the multi-channel guys do you know, at different degrees of well. Uh, then there's, there's co-marketing. You might give your money to somebody else. Co-op funding, you give your money to someone else to spend. They spend it and you see the benefit come through your sales through another channel. Again, hard to attribute. So how do you close the loop on this? How can you, from the Facebook page in Brazil, or the Orkut page in Brazil, choose that, choose that as a market with a, one of our few social media successes with our old platform, Orkut, uh, and they're looking at a beer brand, and then they go off and buy one. Seems pretty tough ask. Well, we think absolutely vital to this is going to be mobile technology. What Christine and, and Charlie both talked about were global platforms, <laughs> LinkedIn, and, and how do you build a global uh, temple? The Greek temple's global. How do you do a global platform, but with local execution, local and social execution, sat on top of a global platform? And we think mobile is going to be a massive part of the answer. And I'll show you, hopefully, if the, a video here. Have we got any volume? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Here's an Idea, a minute and a half or so of marketing insight. I'm Hal Bryce. Today, I want to share one of the coolest marketing things I've seen in quite a while. This is a case study from Tesco out of Korea. Now, Tesco is that big global retailer based in England, but they actually operate all around the world. Their stores in Korea, however, were struggling because their main competitor outstored them by a large margin, and they couldn't build stores fast enough to catch up. So they asked themselves the question, how can we become number one without having to build stores? And their answer was to create virtual stores. Take a look at this. What they did was that they put in these Korean subways these virtual stores that were basically flat billboards and it looked like a grocery store. While they're waiting for their train to come in, customers walk up to the store and punch a picture of the product they want with their QR code that's on each product. Uh, that goes into their shopping cart on their phone, which then is in turn sent to Tesco. And by the time they get home from work, right behind them comes the guy from Tesco with their products. It really takes a lot of stress out of shopping, and it allows them to take time, which would be normally dead time, and actually turn it into productive time. So that's just a sample of where the world of smartphones and things like QR codes are going, taking a lot of the hassle out of shopping. So if you're a retailer, the question for you is, do you have a mobile strategy? If not, it's time to get one. That's Here's an Idea. Thanks for watching. I'm Hal Bryce. And then, so, so that was looking at QR codes, which bizarrely, in the world of smartphones, seems like almost out of date now. I, you know, I was thinking and talking about that, I guess, a year or so ago, QR codes, visual goggles. In fact, we're launching, uh, I think this week, maybe I'm jumping the gun slightly, uh, in the UK, connecting our Google goggles rather than with QR codes, but with real-time image search. So uh, effectively putting image footprints. So uh, picture of some clothes, maybe uh, some sports apparel in a shop window, take a photograph of it, get the discount, or get the image search directly delivered to your phone. So keep an eye out for that at some point uh, coming to London sometime soon. But take that on a stage, which is when your, your, your smartphone starts to become the actual execution device. So you're buying through the, through the phone. And I'll just, which we've now launched Google Wallet in the States. So I'll just show you a video on that. You know, think about the world that is currently, oh, I'll let other people explain better than me. What the consumer is looking for today is fun shopping experience, but she also wants it simple and easy. And I think we accomplish both with Google Wallet. In the US alone, we have over 30 million customers that come through our restaurants each week. The ability to use a technology like Google Wallet to help improve the customer experience for those 30 million people that come into our restaurants is critically important. We're a fun store to shop in. We want to have fun. We want our customers to like enjoy the environment. That's what I think Google Wallet can bring to American Eagle as well. I think it is game changing from an experience point of view. If you think about a customer walking into a store, they now have information at their fingertips, value at their fingertips, things that didn't exist before. 
To me, Google Wallet organizes uh, someone's um, personal data in a way that's much more secure, and it actually gives them the ability to take less things with them when they leave the house. Google Wallet will improve the shopping experience. It'll make the transaction faster and easier. It'll do it in one touch on the tap of her phone. It's amazing. It's amazing for the customer. It's going to change how people shop, how they want to pay, how they think about going to the stores. And it's going to happen fast. No one says, oh, good, I get to go check out now. Anything we can do to make that process faster and simpler and easier for the customer is going to help them and help us in the long run. Value is no longer lowest price. It's what people value individually. And this obviously allows us to talk to a consumer in a one-to-one -one relationship on the things that they value most. They could be walking down the street, thinking about lunch, type lunch into their smartphone, and instantly receive an offer from Subway. Once they're in the restaurant, they go through the ordering process as they typically would. But at checkout, they basically are able to tap to pay, moves them through more quickly, and gives them a better customer experience overall. So Google Wallet really allows us to create that one-to-one -one relationship in a meaningful way with the consumer on things that matter most to her. The idea behind Google Wallet is that if now we've offered her a much easier way to transact with us, it will keep her in the store longer and hopefully have her shopping more. We do see incremental sales coming from our participation with Google Wallet. We think it's going to be a home run with customers and very important to the subway business moving forward. Yes, we're going to launch something that's going to be great, it's going to be cool, it's going to be exciting, it's going to be very usable, it's going to be customer friendly, but what's the next step? You know, what's around the corner? And that's what excites me the most. So, always finishing off, Scott talked about those, those three different connections. And without even knowing any script, and this hasn't been planted, here are my, my view of those three connections. Look, look how that works. I, honestly, <laughs> I didn't know anything about the script. Uh, in fact, I just put this together at sort of two o'clock in the morning, Friday night. Uh, I hadn't been out drinking, honestly. First stage of the internet. Wouldn't want to call it Internet 1.0 because I, I hate those memes, but it very accurately describes people going to the, information, to the internet for information. You went there, either to a portal or uh, to a bulletin board or whatever else you wanted to call it, and get stuff. Very useful. Hot, you know, email was a killer app because you were getting stuff. Web 2.0, using that number that I just said I wouldn't use. Democratization of production. People can now make stuff. The internet is now about interacting. You know, it, it has suddenly become something where people can influence each other, but still you are going to the internet. It is something there on a screen that you go to and then you put stuff in. <coughs> this world here, we talked about a global platform, Google Wallet being one example, there are many others but with, and as they described in the video, very, very personalised local connections, making that one-to-one -one connection. I'm this person. You can imagine a world quite quick. There are no prices in shops. You go in. Why, why are they going to put the price on a loaf of bread? Because if I'm on one layer of a loyalty scheme, my price of bread might be different. And everyone will have their own customised data set in the world. Why, why would I, as a company, want this dumb sledgehammer to sell my loaf of bread when I can now customise that to everyone. Uh, as, as, as the world has already seen to a certain degree with news. If you look at the world that was editorialised newspapers, one thing answers it. Now you've got a guarantee nobody that I know has the same news feeds, RSS, whatever you want to call it, Twitter feeds as, as I have. I've already customised that and made it personal. That's going to happen to every interaction with, with all of the retailers, but arguably all the different data sets that are out there in the world. You could say health is another interesting one. You know, one big platform, UK's abjectly failed to deliver that so far, you could argue, but uh, those data sets that are out there, how can we not make them more personal and useful for people? But the challenge is, you know, how do you actually do that? There's more and more, all these exabytes of data filling up these massive, massive at scale data centers. You know, voice search, I don't know whether any of you have seen it, I, I haven't got a demo uh, 
visualizer, but effectively speaking into your phone and having a search back or translating from English into French. And the way that's done is by taking that single voice file, your, your, just a recording of your voice, it's not done on the phone, it's sent off to a data center. Then tens of thousands of processors vote. What does that file sound most like? That file sounds like are oh, tens of other thousands of, oh, that kind of sounds like the world SpongeBob SquarePants. Uh, to be fair, it didn't work immediately, but it's voting there. Well, oh, this is a tough one. So the computers, that's how I think about computers, a little bit too friendly with them. Uh, and then that data set built up. You've now got You've now got this idiot in Surrey on a Sunday evening making that search query. That's now part of a data set somewhere. So next time somebody knows or wants to know how to get across the bridge, oh, we've heard this query before. We got it in our files. We can make some connection to that. The challenge is, how do you make those connections? And it's a mathematical challenge. You know, Hal Varian, our chief economist, it's the, it's the statisticians, it's the quants. Who would have thought the likes of Bill Gates, you know, our, our beloved Larry and Sergey, who would have thought they would be the rock stars, the billionaires, who 20 years ago would have seen insane. If somebody had said to me at school, well, actually it did happen, but if somebody had said, you'll be trendy and cool doing computer science, I would have said, no, not really the case. Uh, I'll have to come up with something else to be more interesting. I think the same is now true about statistics. The computers can now get the data, they can do stuff. So the phones are now incredibly powerful computers. They're now processing all this information. The challenge now is for people to make the connections between those massive data sets and make those connections useful so people can actually deliver for their companies and arguably you know, for the wider society by using all that information in a, in a meaningful way. So that's kind of where we got to at the end there. You know, I'm tempted by a job that involves beer, I have to admit. That's my, my, other, my, other, my other big takeaway from today. You know, I think there's this, there's this world which is digitally enabled. How can all the people that are useful and good at cranking data help out that digitally enabled world and those companies? And our, 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 our president now, uh, Eric Schmidt, he went and gave the, the McTaggart lecture a few, a few weeks ago up in Scotland. And, he, he bemoaned, you know, I think it's traditional in McTaggart lectures to, to bemoan certain things. Uh, he bemoaned the British educational system for its lack of ability. You know, historically, we had these amazing scientists who were also artists and poets. And now we seem to not be able to teach people computer science. It's, it, to hear about you know, children, now the speed that they pick up on these things, our educational system, does it deliver on the promise? And, and my, just to leave you with this kid's anecdote and one last comment, of this weekend, the use of technology, following on from Christie's point about the, about the two-year-old. So I've got a two-year-old who tried new TV, the one I bought at Christmas, so I didn't make that story up. The old TV's gone into the playroom. I see her regularly trying to swipe the TV screen to change channel, <laughs> which does strike me as a little bit strange. I'm like, it's not an iPad, not yet. Uh, yeah. That's a, that's a challenge. And then my four-year-old was, so I think, okay, I've kind of done the whole, we're kind of over the SpongeBob thing now. Floods of tears. He was, he came in, uh, and I couldn't pause the TV show he was watching. Uh, I can't remember what it was. Last night, just before tea, my wife was out. I was trying to, hence all the shenanigans with SpongeBob SquarePants. I was in charge. Uh, I, I'm, trying to get tea ready, put him in front of the TV. He wants his program paused. Oh, okay, fine, it's DVD. It's not, it's real TV. And I'm like, no, Rory, we can't pause the TV. Washing, you know, gnashing of teeth. He comes in, sits down at the TV, he goes, oh, oh, that's on the real time, that, that, that's on the always on TV. Oh, what? It's on TV, he goes, oh yeah, yeah, that was on the always on TV. I'm like, my word. You know, what they see as the future is, Everything's plausible, everything's for me, everything's the way I want it. That they then go to school, computer science lessons are trying to teach them about the stuff they knew as a two-year-old. Showing them how word works is not computer science. Teaching them how to code in JavaScript might be computer science. And this is what Eric you know, finished off by saying. And the last comment, and the reason I sort of went off into that odd cul-de-sac, this, how do you make the data useful for people, is about polymaths. 
You can't have your quants and your IT people and your mathematicians sat in one corner and give them a question and say, go away there and do your thing and come back with an answer in six months. And by the way, I don't want to see the Excel. You need to work with them, you know, CMOs and CIOs together, but more importantly, you need to change this culture and drive a culture where it's not the lovies and the geeks. It's the people who know about this stuff can also relate to the people that have marketing goals. You're marketing people and data quants all working together in terms to make sense of this and deliver on, on the promise and the opportunities that are there.